So Jim has his small gather. Eric, you see, he's slowly heating this nice glass plate. Now, if you'd like, I'll pass this around the audience and you'll get a chance to see exactly what they're dealing with. If I can introduce that here, please don't drop it. It's glass. So if you drop it, it's going to break. We don't want that to happen. And it took lots and lots of hours to prepare that piece of glass for earlier. That's real similar to the one that we're going to use today for the demonstration. So Jim has introduced that air to the blowpipe again. It's going to let that air expand. It's going to push a little bubble up into that small gather of glass. And he'll have a nice little bubble trapped in there. Yes. He's going in and out of the reheating furnace. You see that numerous times when you're wondering why. He needs to heat that glass slowly. If he tries to heat it too fast, it would break. Thermal shock would cause the glass to break. And what, he's, what you see him doing at the benches, he's rotating that piece of glass because he knows that the very inside of the furnace is hotter than the temperature at the door. So to get a nice, even, consistent heat, he rotates that piece of glass. The history of glass is more than 4,500 years old. Glass material has been around for the humans for a good long while. But the glass blowing process is only a little over 2,000 years old. The Romans are given credit for beginning the glass blowing process. And it was around that time when someone discovered that if you collected the glass on the end of a tube instead of on the end of a solid rod, you could introduce air and it opened up an entirely new avenue for working with the glass material. So you see that color inside the furnace getting more and more orange. It's getting hotter and hotter. And that's going to help Eric keep that nice glass plate so that it'll be nice and soft and they can begin their demonstration and do them with that roll up. You see the glow of the orange on the metal bar? That means that bar is getting nice and hot, a little over a thousand degrees. The glass itself is getting even hotter. Eric continues to rotate that piece of glass so that he can get it to heat evenly. And we're going to prepare it so that Jim will have an opportunity to pick that up. Now he's begun the blowing process by initiating the bubble, and he's used this metal plate that we have here on the right-hand side of the stage, my, my right-hand side, your left-hand side, so that he can cool and shake between the team. There we go. All right, here we go. He's going to touch it up. He begins to roll. There you have it. See, he's got a nice curve. And now he'll heat that glass on the blowpipe and he'll be able to bring both ends together. And have that very nice decorative pattern that he's set out to use. Nicely involved process. Takes lots of skill, lots of preparation time. And then Jim will have his opportunity here to create a really nice vessel. Eric's using that wet paper to brush off a little bit of the kiln shelf wash that was left from using it, using that ceramic shelf to heat that glass. Little bits of debris, little bits of kiln wash, if you're familiar with ceramics, might stick there. So to make sure that they don't have any of those real imperfections left on the glass, you can rub them with that paper before they get fused because it is too hot. Any questions? Jim's going to spend some time to heat that up, bring those ends together, and make sure that there's a nice, smooth, seamless 
attachment. Well, if there's no questions in the audience, why don't I ask you a question? Who knows what glass is made of? What's the main ingredient for glass? Do you know? Sand, yes, but not just any sand, a special silica sand, high in quartz. The more pure that silica sand, the better. Oftentimes there are other minerals mixed in with the sand, and those minerals or impurities will cause the glass to have different colors. If there's a lot of iron in the sand, the, gra the glass will be green. But of course, different glass creators, glass makers, they use that to understand it to make green glass. You add a little more iron oxide. To make a blue glass, you would add cobalt oxide. Or to make a very nice aqua color blue, you could use copper oxide. Different minerals and metal oxides are added to the glass recipes to form or to make different color of glass. Now we don't rely on those kinds of uh, chemistry involvements here on our stage. We purchase colored glass from different manufacturers so that we can use it in the process. We leave the chemistry part to different manufacturers so that they can make the colors and then we use the colors just here on the stage in different formats to be able to make the different kind of decorative techniques that we use. Yes. here in the front recognize that the bottom of the plate that we are passing around is a solid dark color and the colors on the top have all of this different information on there. The reason for that is to give it a nice even backing. Glass colors, because they're made with different metal oxides, will have what we like to refer to as different viscosities. Uh, the simple term that we use to refer to them is some are stiff and some are soft. To make it a nice, even, and easily available color pattern to blow out, Jim uses one solid color that rests next to the bubble, and those other colors then won't have such an influence on how they start to blow out. If you have a solid color, a stiff color next to a soft color, as you're heating and doing the blowing process, the soft color is going to have a tendency to want to expand much quicker. So to alleviate that as much as possible, you use one solid color next to the bubble, and that allows you to have a nice even blow as you expand the bubble. So you've seen Jim working, making that scene, getting it together nicely and smoothly. He's going to do that because he's going to want to collect a little more glass over this pattern. He knows that if there are any little imperfections, any little divots, little dimples, little creases from doing that beginning part of the process, any of those can trap an air bubble. And so to avoid trapping an air bubble, he wants the surface to be real nice and smooth. Now sometimes you'll see bubbles in the glass. And oftentimes artists will use the bubble as a decorative technique. But in this case, he wants it to be nice and smooth, nice and flat. So when he talks the glass over, there won't be any of those little bubbles. All right, he's close to being ready, but I'm going to take this opportunity to be able to invite everybody to come and see the Corning Museum of Glass. We're located in Corning, New York. That was pretty nice, wasn't it, huh? We saw Jim squeeze the end of that cylinder and bring that color down to a small point. And then he tapped that off so that he gets that real nice even coverage on uh, the form that he's going to make for us today. Now, he used a couple of different hand tools. You saw him use that set of jacks. It's a set of tongs, basically, that have flat blades. 
he's able to squeeze the glass and cause a constriction in the glass to make it squeeze together. Now, to break that free, you saw him squeeze it with a pair of what we call diamond shears. And those diamond shears are a very special tool for the glass trade because they don't involve diamond cutting surfaces. It's the shape of the cutting surface that forms the diamond. And in doing so, it squeezes the glass to a small point before it cuts it, leaving only a very small stop. If you were to use a straight pair of shears, then you would leave a big long star in the glass, and it might not be as pleasant to see the look at. That wooden scoop tool that you saw him using, he was cooling and shaking the glass with that wooden block. They're made out of cherry wood, our wooden tools, and we keep them soaked in water going through the process. You understand that all of this color pattern is really just that one narrow piece of glass that he started with. Anybody else who sees it might wonder, oh, how did he get that red glass right there? Or how did he get that green, green glass? And how did he get it so big? But you've seen it because it's really a veneer of these color patterns in a lot of clear glass around it. Uh, I'm not sure. This might be the last gathering it makes. I'll have to watch it a little bit. I mean, that's up to him. You know, he gets there. The gentleman asked, how many gathers is he going to make? I could ask, and maybe Jim would tell us, but it's up to him how many gathers he wants to make. Are you going to do it another gather? Is this your final gather, Jim? Yeah, it is. Okay, this is his final gather. I got a bit of a there we go. Yep. Today's our last day. We have a 300-pound melting tank. We didn't fill it full. You can see the glass stretching. And now, with Eric's help and those jacks, he's squeezing a constriction into the glass. And it's just off the end of the blowpipe. By holding it down, they use gravity to help elongate the shape. And he's got a nice little neckline started. There, we'll probably keep that again. And they may make it a little bit more restricted. He'll, he'll get a nice tight neckline in there, and that will allow him to have what we like to refer to as a weak point. That narrowest part of the glass will be a weak point. And that jack line or neckline will serve as a nice score so that later on in the process he'll break it free right on that line. Yeah. So you can see the way the two of them are working that working with the glass is often a team type of sport. It's a team endeavor. A little more air starting to inflate that glass even more start to enlarge in that shape and form, but I have a feeling that they've got a lot more in store for us before he arrives at the final shape. Eric's going to re-wet that paint. The temperature there, that, that neckline that he squeezed in early on we talked about, the temperature there needed to be about a thousand degrees. If that neckline was too hot, when he dripped a little bit of water on it, the water would have just run off. And if it was too cold when you drip the water on it, it would have cracked uncontrollably. But when the temperature is right, he's got that score line set in there, right? A little bit of water creates a fracture. And then you saw him tap the pipe, and that's what caused the fracture to break the glass and release it from the blowpipe. Now they attached it to that punchy rod ahead of time. And that was very important as well, because that punchy rod is something they know they're going to want to take off later on before they're pushing it away. And that temperature there is going to be, on the punchy, is going to be hot enough so that it'll stick and adhere, but not so hot that it'll fuse permanently. Nice little squeeze. Very nice. And here, add some detail, make it nice and straight. 